Okay, well, we can make a start. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our presentation evening on Antarctica, the Falklands, and South Georgia. I'm Sarah Frost. I'm Nature Trek's marketing manager and a tour leader, and I'm joined tonight by one of our long standing tour leaders, Tim Melling. And I've been working for Nature Trek for uh, nine years. Tim's been with us for uh, over 20 years, I think, Tim. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this January, I was delighted to join him guiding our exclusive three week uh, wildlife cruise down in Antarctica with 100 guests. So tonight, we're going to bring you the highlights from the trip. So whether you were there with us and are going to enjoy reliving the memories or whether you're here just to hear more about the trip, then sit back and relax because we're going to take you on a journey there uh, throughout this evening. If you do have any questions, please feel welcome to pop them into the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen and we'll answer those towards the end of the talk. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tim. OK, welcome, everybody. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining. Um, so we're going to cover the full three week trip from Antarctica, the Falkland Islands and South Georgia, the whole big triangular uh, tour that we did. Um, I'm uh, we're, we're quite limited for time, so I'm going to skip through it and we're going to start off in uh, Ushuaia, which is the first slide, please, Sarah. Yeah, it's there we go. Yeah. So Ushuaia is the most southerly town on the planet. Uh, right at the southern uh, tip of uh, of, of uh, South America. And it's not a very big place, as you can see, and it's surrounded by uh, 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 the Tierra del Fuego National Park. And um, we usually arrive in the evening, then we go to our hotel, and then in the morning we have a full day to explore Tierra del Fuego National Park. So I'll just talk about a few of the highlights that we saw this year. Next, si next please, Sarah. Um, the first one is a, a, a bird that I've long wanted to see, and we saw both male and female. This is the Magellanic woodpecker, um, a, a absolutely huge woodpecker, about the size of the big pileated that you get in uh, North America or the black woodpecker that you get in Europe. Males have got a huge, big red head. And uh, these large woodpeckers are always found at very low density, so not that easy to find. But we managed to find both male and female this time. Next. Um, also, uh, a really scarce uh, duck. This one is classified as near threatened. It's got a very restricted range distribution and it tends to occur only on relatively fast flowing, clean, big rivers in that area. It's uh, known as the spectacle duck because it looks like it's got a pair of spectacles on the end of its nose. But it also goes by the name of bronze wing duck, which seems a bit of a, an odd name because when you look at the speculum in its wing, it looks pink from this angle. But it's one of those odd things that when you look at it from different angles, it bounces like those uh, cars you can get with the color change. It bounces between pink and bronze. And uh, the Spanish name for it uh, translates as dog duck, because when it instead of quacking, it makes a little barking noise like a dog. <laughs> so we're nice to see those. Next one, please, Sarah. Yeah, and uh, uh, just a few uh, passerines that we saw. This is the fire-eyed diukon. Um, I don't know what a diukon is. I think this is only the diu the only diukon on the planet, but it's certainly got a fiery eye. It's a, a kind of uh, one of the tyrant flycatchers. Um, uh, they're usually quite common in that area, but a handsome bird nonetheless. And next... The uh, and uh, the tufted tit tyrant. Uh, what a great alliterative name that one has as well. They're tiny little things. These with a, an amazing crest. Um, I should say everything in this part of the world seems to have been uh, landed with the name tyrant, which makes them seem like bullies. But it's because they're all from a group of uh, a, an early offshoot of the songbirds that are known as the subossine passerines. And the first one to be discovered of this family was the um, uh, the eastern kingbird. And the eastern kingbird was sometimes known as the tyrant because it, it chased off big birds, little birds, everything. It was, uh, and that was its nickname. So when they found that all these other ones were related to kingbird, they called them the tyranny. So the name tyrant keeps cropping up again and again in birds from particularly South America. Next. 
And um, so uh, we see lots of other things as well. I've just um, uh, cherry picked a few there. But then we get on the uh, the Ortelius, which is going to be our home for the next three weeks. Uh, a super uh, boat with lots and lots of uh, viewing space front and back. But uh, it's uh, great because there are higher up decks if people want to sort of see further and scan for whales. And then there are lower decks if people want to photograph seabirds. And uh, so uh, and enough space to keep everyone happy. So uh, what we usually do is we usually set off in the evening and then it goes dark after a relatively short period of time. And then we spend uh, the next full day completely at sea. Next slide, please. So um, there's plenty of time to see the abundant seabirds that are in the uh, the, the the seas in this area. Uh, the first one I uh, put in is black browed albatross. It's actually quite difficult to look at the sea in that area and not see a black browed albatross. It really is one of the commoner seabirds down there. And um, to think that uh, the, the single one that turned up in Yorkshire a couple of years ago and had people coming from all over the country to try and get a glimpse of it. And yet after five minutes at sea down there, most people are sort of almost ignoring them. They're such a commonplace bird. Next. And um, uh, there are only seven species of skewer in the world. There are four in the northern hemisphere and there are three in the southern hemisphere, uh, are all associated with the higher latitudes and uh, lower latitudes as well. So and uh, the, this is the Chilean skewer, the, the one with the very dark cap and uh, the lovely gingery color. But um, the only it, it's it really is a South American bird. So the only time we see that is when we're fairly close to the coast on the morning of uh, that we set off. But if you want to see all the world skewers and you've seen the northern ones, you, uh, you can usually see the uh, uh, complete the list of skewers by uh, adding chili in there. Next. And uh, this is the uh, southern giant petrel. It's the, uh, the one of the biggest, uh, well, it is the biggest uh, petrel on the planet, the proper tube noses. It's got a wingspan of two meters and tips the scales at about five kilograms. And again, it's a really common bird. We also see northern giant petrel, which is very, very similar, but I'll, uh, I'll leave that one for now. Next. Uh, this bird always makes me smile because it goes by the name of white chinned petrel, even though if you uh, you need to get your microscope out to have a look at the white chin because it's about uh, 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 just a few millimeters there. You can see it just below the bill. So it was clearly named by somebody in a museum looking at a, a dead skin of it. Um, but uh, white chinned petrel it is. It's another very, very big thing, much bigger than a fulmer. Uh, um, and it's uh, you can see it's a petrel with the tube on the end of its nose there. Yeah. Next. Um, great shearwater is a, a bird that uh, many of the people want to see because it's one of those birds. Uh, it does the opposite of what most of our birds do. Most of our birds uh, breed in Britain and then travel south for the winter. But this is one of the birds that breeds in the southern hemisphere and travels north for their winter, which is our summer. So in summer, when the wind's blowing in the right direction, these things occur off the coast of Britain, but they're always highly sought after. They're a, you know, a really uh, distinctive bird with lots of little features to look for yet down there they're very very common and again it's uh, it's one that you can virtually guarantee to see down there next and wilson's petrel as well this is a, another one that does exactly the same as the great shearwater it turns up in greater or lesser numbers off the southwestern approaches and elsewhere in uh, in britain but usually out at sea but down there, it's so abundant. It really is, again, difficult to look at the sea and not see a Wilson's petrel. Um, you can see it has uh, distinctive, very long toes. It, they protrude from the end of the tail, which is what's going on down there. But otherwise, it's a little small thing, rather like a storm petrel. Next. And prions as well. Uh, we usually see three or four different species of prion, but they all look much of a muchness. They've all got this little black W and they've all got a black tail tip as well. This one happens to be the slender billed prion. And uh, it's just reminding me that when I was uh, uh, down in Antarctica uh, a couple of months ago, um, I was asked a, asked a question which completely stumped me and I didn't know the answer, but I do now. But um, what I was asked was, it was from a, a virologist and he said that we have prions in virology 
uh, uh, what's the etymology? Is it the same as the bird? And I didn't know because I'd never heard of a prion, but I do now because prion was a, a, a term that was coined in 1982 and it's a concatenation of protein infection. So they get the PR off protein and the ion off infection and, and make prion. Whereas this comes from the old uh, ancient Greek word for a saw because they've got serrated beaks to help them uh, catch hold of uh, little krill and small fish and things. So they've got a bill like a saw, which is what a prion is in uh, ancient Greek. So there you have it. That's the uh, the answer to that one. Um, next one, please, Sarah. And then uh, we have a night. Uh, so having had a full day at sea, we have a night at, at sea. And then at dawn the following morning, we're just arriving at the Falkland Islands. And there we are, sunrise and the Falkland Islands. Um, the one th the big drawback of the Falkland Islands, next slide, please, uh, there, is the crowded beaches. Just look at that. Look, there's just uh, hardly anywhere to uh, park there, except as you've probably guessed. They're not crowded beaches at all. They're crowded with penguins and, and nothing else. You hardly see any other human beings when you're down there because we go to the remote outer islands that have got lots and lots of wildlife still. Uh, this is a whole group of Magellic, M M Magellanic penguins and a few gentoos in there as well. But look at that beach. It's just absolutely wall to wall penguins. Uh, there's lots of good penguin breeding colonies here. Next one. Uh, I call this photograph the beach boys. These are all Magellanic penguins, and most of them are boys as well because they are bigger than the females. That's a female over on the far left, the smaller ones. But uh, and they're very, very sociable. They go swimming together. They come out. They hang around on the beach together. And they're quite unusual amongst penguins. Next slide, please. Because they nest in burrows. Um, they usually have twins as well. Many of the bigger penguins just have a single egg and uh, a single chick. But they often, uh, they always lay two eggs and usually rear two chicks. But quite often, um, one of the eggs just doesn't hatch and it stays down the burrow. And um, so uh, there's plenty of things to try and feed on things like that. So the next slide, here we saw a brown skewer, another species of skewer, and it went down the burrow and came out with this clearly very old, probably never going to hatch egg. And this was its prize. And then it spent the next half hour trying to get into the egg. But uh, there it was, the, uh, the, the egg thief down on the Falklands. Next. Um, these are um, uh, Gen 2 penguins. Um, they're uh, a very, very common breeding bird almost everywhere that we go down there because they're found in the Falkland Islands, which is really rather warm and, and temperate. Uh, and then they're found right the way down, almost as far as you can get in Antarctica as well. But uh, so a very wide range. Bizarrely, they were given the scientific name Papua because when the first specimen was named, the type specimen, um, the, the describer was told that it was collected in Papua New Guinea. Obviously, a label had got mixed up. But once you've named something, the, uh, the name sticks. So now they're uh, lumped with a, a completely irrelevant uh, and inappropriate uh, name. So Pagascalis Papua pure as the uh, Gen 2 penguin. Next. And then you also get, um, uh, these are uh, southern rockhopper penguins. These are some of the golden crested penguins, although uh, uh, when they've been uh, in the water and they've got wet hair, you can't actually see the crest. So uh, you can see them when there's no rocks to hop on, they hop on the beach as well. So uh, there's uh, three of them hopping together uh, out of the sea. But uh, you'll see what they look like when they don't have wet hair in the next slide, which is uh, uh, there. It's, um, it's, uh, it, it's scientific name. Eudyptes chrysolophus translates as uh, one uh, as excellent diver with a uh, a golden crest, uh, uh, and uh, there you have the golden crest. There, they look much better when they've not got wet hair. Next slide. And uh, there, uh, it's a great place for penguins, is the Falkland Islands. There's also a number of um, of king penguins, a relatively small number, but a biggest colony to uh, to guarantee to see them. And uh, there's a, a couple of options to uh, see these king penguins, but that's obviously a, a species that uh, is more of a specialist uh, for South Georgia because that's the best place on the planet to see king penguins. Next slide. Yeah, this is a, uh, a black-browed albatross chick, and there are black-browed albatross breeding colonies on the Falkland Islands, and uh, you can see that they build uh, a nest that looks like a giant egg cup and it's raised off the, the ground around. And they always nest in little wet, uh, muddy gullies. And it's basically so that the adults don't have to go very far to grab a beak full of mud to construct these things because they're very big and they have to repair them every year 
and, and rebuild them. But they do try and keep the same nest every year. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see the extent of this colony uh, looking down. Can you see that everything is concentrated just in the muddy gully where uh, the, the adults can grab a, a beak full of uh, mud? But as soon as you get the raised ground, uh, that's where the, the, the substrate is dry, you don't get any black browed albatrosses at all. But wherever you get the muddy gullies on the uh, Falklands, you'll usually get a little colony of, um, uh, of black browed albatrosses there. Uh, there's a few adults on the nest there, but they were mainly uh, chicks. And then uh, just offshore from the black browed albatross colony, we looked down and there were some uh, Commerson's dolphins cavorting in the uh, water down there. They always remind me of belted Galloway cows. They've got that same black head, white body, black rear end, and uh, uh, they're a, a, a wonderful little thing, but not that easy to uh, photograph because even though they're not that rare in the Falklands, you, you know, they just sort of come up for a few seconds and go down, a bit like uh, harbour pythoses do in, uh, in Britain, so a difficult one to photograph. Next one. The um, uh, almost every goose in the world has males and females identical. But down in the south of South America, there's two species that have wildly different uh, males and females. These are the upland geese, and that's a male-female pair. The female's got the is the brown one with the barred body on the left, and the male is the white one on the right. But even more striking is the kelp goose, which is the next slide. And um, uh, you can see that that's the male on the left. It's absolutely pure snow white all over with a black beak. And the female is chocolate brown with these lovely white bars and a, a pink beak. So very, very different. But uh, and those are, they feed largely on seaweed, even though the scientific name Chloephagia means uh, grass feeding. But um, they uh, and, and both those species are very common on the Falkland Islands. So we usually see uh, uh, lots and lots of those. Next one. Um, these are called crested ducks, another bizarrely named one, because I've never seen one with a, 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 a anything much of a crest. Uh, this is male and female together, the, the almost identical sexes, but uh, and a lovely fiery eye on the uh, uh, on the birds as well. But uh, again, a common bird on the Falklands, one that we're uh, uh, guaranteed to see down there. And the next one is the Falkland uh, is a Falkland Islands endemic, and this is the Falkland Island flightless steamer duck um flightless because it can't fly but it moves around the water by um flailing its its wings around in the water and it moves like one of the mississippi paddle steamers which is how it got the name steamer duck um there are three species on the uh, uh sorry four species of steamer duck on the planet uh three of them are flightless and uh, this one on the falklands is an endemic to the falkland islands the other three all occur in southern south america as well they do a lot of fighting as well and you can see those orange studs are like little knuckle dusters that they have and they uh, whenever they're um, uh, having fisticuffs you can see them clouting each other with these uh, robust wings that they've got but uh, when you see them coming face on with a beak like that they remind me of a mute swan it's uh, just uh, you know you can see what I mean with the uh, isolated eye like a young mute swan isn't it uh, next please Yes, this bird goes by the um, uh, the name of tussock bird. That's its local name on the Falklands, but uh, uh, most of the bird books call it a blackish synclodes. Uh, synclodes is a, an odd word. It means like a dipper, even though they don't particularly look like dippers, but there's a whole family of them in southern South America. And uh, the, the blackish synclodes is um, this species that most authorities consider that it is um, a, a Falkland Island endemic although uh, uh, there's a bit of dispute over that, and some people just think it's a race of the black synclodes. But anyway, it's common on the beaches of the uh, Falkland Islands, and it's called tussock bird because it likes to nest in amongst the giant tussock grass that uh, occurs on the Falklands. Next. Um, these are Magellanic uh, oyster catchers. Um, very like our oyster catchers, except they've got a, a very different wing pattern and a bright yellow eye instead of a red eye, which ours have. But apart from that, they look and behave even to the sort of the synchronized dancing that the uh, the breeding pairs do. And they even make a noise like a, uh, uh, like the British oyster catcher as well. But uh, they're a common bird. But they're not the only oyster catcher because the next slide shows a uh, blackish oyster catcher. I don't know where the ish comes in because, uh, you know, it's a really nice black uh, uh, head and uh, body there I suppose the wings are a little bit browner but uh, yeah so two species of oyster catcher to enjoy down there uh, on the beaches of the Falklands next one please Sarah 
And uh, uh, another wader, uh, this is the Magellanic Snipe. Everything down there seems to go by the name of Magellanic, named after the uh, uh, Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan, who uh, discovered and described a lot of these uh, birds for the first time. It looks pretty much like a, um, a, the snipe we get in Britain, but they're a lot tamer. They just seem that this was just sitting in a uh, in the grass by a, a busy footpath that we were all walking past. And uh, so uh, usually you can get very, very good close views of these things. Next. Um, another tyrant. This is the dark faced ground tyrant. Um, it's um, it looks a little and behaves a little bit like a wheat here. Very, very upright. And they hop around on the on the beaches and on the uh, the grasslands, but not even remotely related to wheat ears. It's much more closely related to the synclodes and the kingbirds in North America and all of those South American birds that are uh, these this group of subossine passerines. But uh, again, another commonish bird on the Falklands. Next one, please. Yes. When is a finch not a finch? Uh, this bird goes by two names, either white bridal finch or black throated finch. Um, the books seem to be about 50 50 split. Um, it's common on the Falklands, a very beautiful bird, and it feeds on seeds and it looks like a finch, but it's actually a tanager, one of these uh, South American jungle birds that's um, uh, there. So, again, convergent evolution and the habitat has made it look and behave like a finch, but it's not even closely related to uh, 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 the European finches. Uh, next one. Uh, this is the grass wren. Um, it's it's found patchily throughout Southern and South America. So it's not found in the jungle areas, but wherever you've got uh, pampas grasslands and things like that, including the tussock grass and the uh, Falklands, uh, the tiny little grass wren. But that's quite a widespread. But much rarer than this is the Cobbs wren, which is the next one, which is a Falkland Island endemic named after a, uh, a, a late 19th century, early 20th century farmer and naturalist on the Falklands called... Um, Arthur Cobb, who was the first person to realise that it was a an endemic species, and he was the uh, um, so got the credit and uh, is now immortalised in its name. Um, again, we usually see those on the beaches down in the Falklands. Next, and, and the striated caracara. Um, this bird is just incredibly tame. It's just completely indifferent to humans. But the trouble is, is it's a predator. And uh, when humans arrived and brought with them lots of sheep and lambs onto the Falkland Islands, uh, these things realised that working in groups, they could actually predate on young lambs, which meant that they were persecuted mercilessly on the Falklands and they were extirpated from large swathes of the Falklands. They're gone from all the big islands, but they survived on a few other islands. And it, uh, it was only outlawed the shooting of them a few years ago. And that was when in 1986, the population was down to just 200 pairs on the Falkland Islands. But since protection, and they've looked after and appreciated them, uh, the population is now up to about 600 pairs. And there's about 400 on uh, uh, Tierra del Fuego, which, uh, but that's only about a thousand pairs in the whole of the world. It really is a very, very rare bird, and um, uh, but one that people just don't ignore and appreciate. The other thing about them is that they are related to um, falcons, but not to hawks and eagles. Uh, the falcons and the hawks and eagles are completely widely separated when their DNA has been analyzed. These are more closely related to macaws than they are to eagles. Next slide. <laughs> right, so uh, leaving the Falklands, I've missed that. We do visit uh, Port Stanley as well and have a, a, a bit of time around there, but I've covered most of the wildlife we're likely to see. But as we leave the Falklands, there are huge colonies of sooty shearwaters, which is another one of these birds that breeds in huge numbers in the south southern oceans and then migrates north. And they're regular around the, the coasts of Britain in uh, in late summer. But down there, it's just that the uh, in the middle of their breeding season and there's huge rafts of them. So uh, we go through rafts of thousands of these things. The next slide shows what they look like when you get them close up. So that's a sooty shear water close up. You don't often see them like that, even down in um, even uh, when you see them on off the coast of Britain. But uh, yeah, it's it's a very, very common bird down there. 
So continuing out, this is where we're heading out towards South Georgia now. And it's uh, we spend two or three days out at sea um, uh, there. But we start to see a lot more seabirds as we're heading uh, further north and, uh, and, and across. We hit a, a different array of seabirds that we didn't see in the early stretch. This is called a black-bellied storm petrel. There's a near identical tropical bird called a white-bellied storm petrel that doesn't have the black stripe down the belly. But apart from that, they're pretty much the same. But this is the one that we see commonly here and right the way down to uh, South America and the, uh, sorry uh, into Antarctica and a much rarer one is the grey rump a uh, grey backed storm petrel which is the next one and uh, you can see no white rump or anything like that uh, pretty unusual for it and it's it's just this lovely grey colour and um, the only way that I've managed to see these is by looking for floating mats of uh, of, of seaweed on the water because there's nearly always in the, near the Falklands there's nearly always a grey backed storm petrel on those and that's how I can manage to get everybody onto it to see it because it's quite an elusive and uh, sought after bird but uh, fortunately we saw lots of them on this trip next um, soft plumage petrel. Um, they used to think that this bird occurred in the southern and the northern hemisphere, but then they realised that all the ones around the Madeira and the Azores were different species, the fierce petrel, the xenos petrel, the deserters petrel, and uh, uh, none of those have a full complete breast band, but ours do have a breast band, uh, the so soft plumage petrel, but they are the, the pterodromas, the ocean winged wanderers, and uh, they're really acrobatic in flight. I don't know how I managed to catch this one here because they never stop moving and it's as if they're on a giant pendulum just uh swinging from uh in these giant arcs uh left and right and uh and uh you know hopefully some of them come close enough to the boat to get photographs of but this is the first year that i've actually managed to get decent photographs of them uh next one please sarah and uh, this uh, wonderful bird goes by uh, several different names. I knew this one from the old Heinzel Fitter and Parslow guide to the birds of uh, Britain and Europe and the Middle East. And they call this bird the Cape Pigeon in those days. It's not a pigeon at all. It's a petrel, as you can see from the tube on its nose. But then it goes also goes by the name of Cape Petrel, uh, named after the Cape, as in, um, uh, as in South Africa, actually. But I prefer the Spanish word that uh, a lot of books still call it, which is Pinto. Tardo petrol, which means painted petrol, and it's got that. I just, I just think that is an exquisite uh, back pattern. Really, really beautiful bird. Uh, next one, please, Sarah. And um, also, when we start to hit the uh, the deep oceans, we start to see a few cetaceans. I'm leaving most of the cetaceans to Sarah, but as this one was close to the Falklands, and that's where I photographed it, I'll put this one in. But this one's called an hourglass dolphin because uh, you can see it's got like an hourglass or an egg timer, if you like, uh, that white marking on the side of the uh, uh, the, the the black uh, uh, coloration, and it's it's got a really swept back fin like one of those old handles on an iron um uh there but uh yeah a, a wonderful bird. again we saw quite a lot of these on the uh, on the trip uh next please over to you is that uh is, is this one uh yours um oh, no, no you can no. oh this, this is, is a, this oh, yeah, is a peels a, dolphin sorry. yeah um this is this was a photograph taken by sarah uh, as you can probably get this is a peels dolphin um fairly range restricted species in the uh, uh the, the south atlantic area and it's got a diagnostic black face and chin uh right the way around but uh uh very very acro acrobatic very hard to photograph as well i never managed to photograph anywhere near as good as this but uh, sarah managed this one <laughs> next please um, we also started to see the bigger albatrosses uh, here. Um, the ones like black-browed albatross are actually, they know those as mollymorks. Those are the smaller albatrosses. But these things have got huge wingspans. These things are, a, this is a, a southern royal albatross, which breeds around New Zealand, but they wander widely in the southern oceans. And so, uh, again, all the trips I've been on, we've seen an, a, a good number of southern royal albatrosses. Northern royal albatrosses is a lot harder to see, but occasionally we see it and then the other one is the bird that does have the guaranteed largest wingspan on the planet which is the uh, uh the wandering albatross this one's been split into a number of species recently uh, but this is the original wandering albatross i think they call this one snowy albatross now but this one breeds on south georgia so we start to uh, as we head towards south georgia we start to see more and more of these big things but they really do look enormous and uh, often they're quite tame they come to the boat and come and have a look at you as the next picture will show as well. 
that's um, uh, just a, a picture of one coming to check us out as it sort of uh, uh, flew right over the, uh, the Ortelius for us. And um, uh, and also, very fortunately, we saw one other species of albatross as well, which was the sooty albatross. Um, we usually see lots of the light mantle sooty albatross, which is a very cold water species that breeds around South Georgia. But this is a very rare and declining albatross from places like Tristan de Cunar and Gough Island that don't normally come as far south as we are. But uh, we just managed to see one bird. And I, it was only on view for a matter of seconds, but somehow I managed to point the camera in its direction and uh, and capture a picture of it, uh, which meant that we could scrutinise it afterwards and confirm the identity as indeed a rare sooty albatross. So that was a good one. And then this is where Sarah's going to take over on the way to uh, South Georgia. Thanks, Tim. Fantastic photo there as well. So yeah, I'm going to take over and be at the helm for taking you on our armchair travel to South Georgia and down to Antarctica. So, so far we've encountered a good variety of seabirds, as Tim has outlined, but also this was a fantastic crossing for cetaceans. So on our evening of leaving the Falklands, we were surrounded by a group of say whales. At one point we had around 25 uh, individuals around the boat, but there could well have been more. Now the say whale is the third largest baleen whale after the blue and the fin whales, getting up to about 21 meters in length. Uh, its scientific name, Borealis, actually means, uh, refers to the north, as in uh, Aurea, um, Aurora Borealis, if you think of the Northern Lights, uh, because it was first discovered in the Northern Hemisphere, but it is also found in the Southern Ocean. Uh, it inhabits cold subpolar waters in the summer, but migrates to subtropical waters in the winter. And this is another photograph of a say whale taken on that evening. Now, fin whales are very similar at the surface, and it can be quite difficult to tell them apart, but say whales are distinguished primarily by their very tall, upright falcate, that means curved, uh, dorsal fin, whereas fin whales have a smaller dorsal fin that rises gently from the back, not abruptly like this one does here. And we continued watching them into the sunset. You can just see uh, on the bottom left here, the faint puff of a blow uh, and they just were these puffs of blows just kept coming up on the horizon as we uh, continued to sail east and we were uh, looking behind us at the sunset and we explained the difference between the fin whale and the say whale in uh, presentations on board to guests so they can be looking out for for these differences but it can be quite hard in practice to actually see this difference uh, in the dorsal fins when you're actually seeing them in the water you've got the light to contend with it might be low light the animals are moving quite quickly perhaps and you also have waves which come up uh, in front of the the fins so getting photographs uh, is usually quite advantageous but um, however when I got home and I was looking through the hundreds of photographs that were taken on this evening I was quite pleased to find this photograph which I'd taken which shows the exact distinctions that I'm referring to. So we have the say whale on the left where the dorsal fin rises abruptly from the body and then the fin whale on the right where the fin sweeps up from the body much more gently. So I was really pleased to be able to capture a photograph of the two of them together, which was uh, fantastic. So as we uh, continued sailing east, we continued to see more cetaceans or a couple of sightings of uh, southern right whales, although they were quite distant. We didn't get good photographs of those. Uh, more Peel's dolphins, hourglass dolphins, uh, and long-finned pilot whales as well, which are a family um, a member of the blackfish family. Um, but something that really got my heart going uh, was this photograph here. How fantastic is this? <laughs> so I saw this, this speck um, two and a half kilometers off the front of the bow. And this photograph is taken with my uh, 400 mil telephoto uh, zoom lens at full length. Uh, I saw this speck and I just saw this rounded fin in the water. I uh, got everyone onto it as quickly as I could, but I really wasn't sure what it was at first. Now, the, the cetaceans move um, up and downwards in the water. So you'll see their fins going up and down, up and down. And this is because their tail uh, is flat in the water. It's horizontal, so it kicks up and down. And that means that their body moves up and down with it. If you were looking at a fish, so perhaps a shark fin or a large tuna or sailfish, because their tails are vertical and they move from left to right, this means that they, their dorsal fin moves from left to right as well. So at first, I really even wasn't, wasn't even sure if I was looking at a cetacean or not, because this animal was seeming to do a little bit of both. But 
Another behavior that cetaceans do is something called logging. And this is where they just rest at the surface very still. And that's what I realized this animal was doing. So I realized fairly quickly it was a cetacean. And I'm pointing it out if you haven't actually seen it. There's a little red arrow to it. Uh, which I should have uh, brought up a minute ago. Um, but zooming in on this photograph, it then arched its back and dove down. And then I realized with total excitement that this is a spectacle porpoise. Uh, and really not much is known about the behavior of spectacle porpoises at all. They're inconspicuous, they're fast swimmers, generally avoid boats as all porpoises do. And as with other members of the porpoise family as well, they're not thought to be highly acrobatic. Um, and there's only been a few documented sightings of them. Uh, and of the documented sightings that there have been, they've been observed in groups of one to five uh, individuals. So we only saw one here. And it's it's really not known what the total population of spectacle porpoise is. And only a handful of stomach contents have ever been examined to tell us what they feed on. Um, the uh, results have found that they eat uh, anchovies and shrimp. But other than that, we really just don't know much about them. And it's hard actually to find a full photograph to show you, but I've managed to get hold of a drawing here so you can appreciate the full majesty of this stunning and beautiful animal. So this is a male with a huge paddle-like dorsal fin. The females have a much smaller fin, but there's a real distinct two-tone color as with uh, many marine animals that don't want to be detected. They're dark on top, so they can't be seen from anything above them very easily. And they're pale underneath to help blend with a lighter surface, water or sky, um, so that anything below looking up at them might not be able to see them immediately. Many species, uh, aquatic species, marine species uh, are like this, uh, like penguins, for example. Uh, this is a, a first record for Nature Trek. We've not seen one before on any of our trips. It was certainly a first for me. Um, and it's since been picked up by um, a whale news organization in Canada, uh, this sighting. So they've got it featured on their website and they'll be talking about it with me on one of their podcasts in the summer. So really nice to be able to see something that was um, so special to, to science to be able to uh, record this. And continuing a second day at sea, uh, we're almost, almost at South Georgia. There's lots of seabirds to keep us interested and parties of prions to be working through. Um, we start to stop seeing or see fewer of the soft plumage petrels around this time and slender bill prions get replaced by Antarctic prions, uh, the abundance of which also provide us with blue petrels pictured here. So this is one of Tim's photos lurking cryptically in their mist. The blue petrels, uh, they're quite small seabirds, uh, close relatives of the prions, but they're easily recognized by their diagnostic white tipped tail, uh, which you can see really quite easily when they're flying around. It looks like it's just been dipped in white paint. And sea days are great fun for spending lots of time out on deck, but there's also lots of talks every day from our expedition team on board and the nature trek leaders. We all give talks, particularly so during the sea days, um, just to provide a little bit of variation. We could easily have three talks given during the day anything on uh, the history of the area to wildlife photography tips to geology. And we eventually arrived at a spot called Shag Rocks, which I've just put a little pin on a map here so you can see how far east we've come and how close we are now to South Georgia. Um, and these are, this is Shag Rocks here, breaking the skyline, a really lovely landscape image, a really remarkable outline cluster of jagged, jagged pinnacles that just tower out from an otherwise empty ocean landscape. And as we sailed here, there's Wilson's and black bellied storm petrels continue to escort us and a wonderful array of albatrosses. We had five species by this point, including our first gray headed and light mantled sooty albatrosses. This is a gray headed albatross uh, photographed here by Tim. Fantastic photo. And the imperial shags that we'd seen further west were now replaced by the South Georgia shags. And we saw these in abundance at shag rocks. And uh, for some, it also turned out to be quite a good day for penguins with four species seen, including a first couple of macaroni penguins. Um, and the highlight for some of us, including me, was seeing a blue whale. Uh, I saw a big blow, tip blue whales can blow about 10 meters into the air. Um, it was all quite quick, but we took a few photographs of what had blown. Um, and this is the best photograph that I got. Uh, but zooming right on into the image, uh, you can see the clear diagnostic mottling on the back, which blue whales have. 
uh, and there's a white chin petrol, I think, there uh, on the right for uh, a size comparison. Um, so really lovely to see uh, a blue whale, the largest animal on the planet. Uh, it was fairly quick, but they are reasonably common around uh, shag rocks. You can see uh, mothers and calves there. Uh, and as we approached South Georgia the next day, we had uh, humpback whales early in the morning for those who were up. Some of them were breaching and putting on a good show, which was just marvelous. And um, we stopped off at this spot here, which is Right Whale Bay. And there's a huge amount here to just stimulate all of the senses. You can hear the eerie, beautiful calls of the Antarctic fur seals. You can smell the king penguin colony ahead of us. Uh, and there are good numbers of giant petrels on the water and king penguins popping up here and there. Uh, and as we approached the rocks, actually, we immediately heard and saw the South Georgia pipit, which is the most suddenly uh, songbird in the world. And we saw it a number of times uh, feeding amongst the seaweed covered rocks. So here it is here. This is one of Tim's photos. It only breeds on the island of South Georgia and nowhere else on the planet. And even here, it's actually not common. It's largely restricted to small islets. And the whaling industry on South Georgia introduced rats which, rats which spread throughout the island and devastated its breeding birds, including the pipit. And it survived only on small offshore islands, which remained rat free. But fortunately, there's been a recent rat eradication program, which seems to have been successful. And the pipit has started to appear on mainland South Georgia again. So it was really lovely to see and hear this little bird. And moving around the bay, we had closer views of Antarctic fur seals and king penguins, and there were hundreds of kings on the beach, but frenzied groups of them going out into the surf in front of our zodiacs as well. Uh, and among the ones on the beach were a number of young birds, all brown and fluffy. Um, and we caught up with our first snowy sheath bills as well on the edge of the colony, uh, which were picking around uh, uh, bits of feces on the rocks. These are uh, white birds. I have a photograph of those, which I'll, I'll show you shortly. Uh, but it's quite fun to watch the king penguins bicker over who, which one is going to be the first one to try and get into the water first and find a, a nice entry point in the surf. Eventually, this one braved a wave and I managed to capture a photograph of it with the other ones uh, looking on. And um, got some giant petrels here, a, a dark morph and a pale morph. Uh, so really just lovely to explore in the zodiacs and, and have the freedom to just enjoy um, what the bay here has to offer and all of the wildlife that's uh, swimming around in the water with us. We also went to Salisbury Plain. Um, we went to do a, a zodiac cruise here, uh, but sadly the swell was too great. So we did a ship's cruise uh, instead in the bay where you've just got you know, you know, thousands upon thousands and thousands of king penguins. Uh, really fantastic to see, even from the ship. But we circumnavigated Prion Island uh, instead, which was home to a wandering albatross colony. And it's not common, really, to have the opportunity to photograph a wandering albatross over land because they spend such a huge proportion of their lives at sea. Uh, so this is uh, one of Tim's photographs. We managed to get a, a good shot of one. And the next day, we landed at Gritviken. Um, one of the most famous whaling stations on South Georgia. And we had the perfect welcoming committee as we walked up the beach and were soon surrounded by boisterous Antarctic fur seals and little gangs of the endemic South Georgia pintails. But these South Georgia pintails scavenge seal carcasses. So they're actually they're omnivores, so they do eat meat. Uh, and they'll scavenge for food alongside um, more sort of typical duck-like vegetation um, or duck-like food, so vegetation, uh, shrimps and snails. And the sexes are very similar. So unlike most ducks where you do have sexual dimorphism, but the male is a little larger with a brighter speculum. So the bright wing patch that you've seen in many ducks, which is a blue color in mallards, uh, it's a, a larger and brighter on, on the males. So it was these birds were amongst the first birds noticed by James Cook, who was the first to land on South Georgia in 1775. And because they've evolved without land-based predators, they're generally quite approachable, not as much as the penguins, but uh, don't mind having their photographs taken. And there's a population of around 2,000 on South Georgia. And there's uh, the museum as well, where we can see uh, interesting collections which are owned by the government of South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, um, obviously a British overseas territory. And the museum is managed and operated by the South Georgia Heritage Trust, which is actually based in Dundee in Scotland. Uh, and we all enjoyed a welcome talk 
by one of the volunteers, but uh, some of us were quite distracted looking at the fur seal pup, which just choose really odd places to curl up. So this one had curl up, curled up right outside the entrance to the museum on a whale skull, just the crown of a whale skull there, which had a nice little depression and it made a comfy little bowl shaped for it just to curl up on. And uh, this one here, I actually filmed because it was so funny. It fell asleep. This is completely asleep, but it fell asleep standing up. Um, and I took a video of it because it was just so precarious. Um, and uh, I've muted the sound, but all you can hear is us laughing uh, in the background of this little thing that was uh, trying to stay up quite well while asleep. Um, and we were delighted to see some enormous southern elephant seals as well. They were lurking uh, and wrestling quite sedately uh, here on the grass. You'd occasionally just hear a big sigh or a, uh, a snort from one. Uh, but really, they didn't move very much at all, but they really are ex extremely huge and enormous. Uh, they occasionally opened an eye uh, and looked a little bit annoyed at the uh, fur seal pups that were playing around them. And uh, we sort of give them a, a disapproving eye as the fur seal pups were barking at each other and play wrestling around them. Um, and it is an old whaling station, um, a, a sad part of the, the history, but this is the, the industry on South Georgia. So this is one of the, the tanks here for storing blubber, which I've just included a photograph of with me standing in front of it, just so you can see uh, the scale of it there. It really was a, a huge industry that it had. Um, and after looking around um, Great Viken, we uh, headed along the coastline for a little Zodiac cruise and back onto the ship. Uh, Great Viken was our only landing on South Georgia this year due to bird flu restrictions at the time, uh, which of course we have to adhere to, which were imposed by the South Georgia government. But we stopped off at a few more fantastic cruise points. So we enjoyed Zodiac cruises at Stromness, at Leith, and in Hercules, Hercules Bay, we did a ship's cruise where this um, there was a macaroni penguin colony. So a photograph here, again from Tim. Uh, there are six species of yellow crested penguins, but macaronis can be distinguished by the sort of sad clown mouth that they have, where they have this downturned gape, which you can just see on this photograph. And like most penguins, they feed mainly on krill and their water soaked uh, plumage of the tiny feathers almost looks like fish scales, doesn't it, when you see it in the light. And unfortunately, macaroni penguins on South Georgia have declined by 50% between the 1950s and 1990s. So they've been classed by the IUCN as vulnerable. The decline is probably due to reductions in their favorite food, which is krill. So it's really special to see them. And this was our only real opportunity to, to do so on the trip. So we enjoyed uh, looking around the colony and certainly cherished our time there. And then from here, we started sailing south and we started to see our first icebergs, which just erupt like buildings or skyscrapers on the horizon. And they're absolutely enormous, enormous and they, I found them just as exciting as the wildlife actually to look at and see the birds and albatrosses flying amongst them and the way that they carve through the water um, and huge uh, caves and arches that they have. It's really quite fa fantastic for photography. And we were all delighted to hear that we'd be able to see the famous A23A iceberg, not the best name, um, it doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but this is the largest iceberg in the world. And we were told that we'd be able to see it if we got up at five o'clock in the morning the next day. But not to worry if we were a little bit late because it would take four hours to sail past. So this is the A23 iceberg here, as it's known. So it broke away from the Antarctic coastline actually way back in 1986. But it's only recently begun a big migration um, because for more than 30 years, it's actually been stuck rigidly to the bottom of the Weddell Sea, like a static ice island uh, and it's it's got a 350 deep uh, 350 meter deep keel to which it's just kept it anchored in place on the seabed but it's gradually been melting and it took until 2020 when it started to refloat and slowly started moving again slowly at first before currents and winds then swept it northwards towards warmer air and waters so this is the path it's taken and the currents are taking it north to warmer waters, so inevitably it is going to melt. But this iceberg is twice the size of Greater London. Um, it's absolutely enormous. And it was incredible just to sail alongside it. You can see the arches that I'm referring to there. It just goes on as far as the eye can see. 
it took hours to go past to have got a Cape Petrol there uh, flying past and uh, really lovely just to keep uh, the photographers entertained and quite astonishing. And we continued south and made our way to Elephant Island. Now this is a famous hot point on Elephant Island. This is Point Wild. And it was here that under the leadership of Frank Wilde, 22 of Shackleton's men survived under lifeboats for four months in the winter of 1916 until they were rescued by the Chilean ship Yelcho. So the landing area just, just is impossibly small. If I move my cursor here, the landing area is here. I do have a photograph which you'll be able to see properly in a second. It just seems an impossibly small spot for 22 men to have survived on. And it was a real privilege for us to see this part of the Shackleton story. And it was a highlight for many people on board. And you can see that it's totally exposed to the elements and open ocean just straight behind us. So really humbling to see. That's the beach there uh, shared with penguin where um, the men stayed in upturned lifeboats. And this is a monument here to uh, the captain of uh, the ship that came to, to rescue them. And uh, from here, we continued south. Um, so this means some more sea days ahead, but really an exciting opportunity to stay out on deck and see what we can find. Um, I find sea days, it's really important to keep energy up. So I happily do a, a cake run for people. So this is me doing a cake run. We get fresh cake at four o'clock every day. So um, not that I was uh, looking at my watch at 3.55 every day by any chance, but running out to go and get some cake certainly keeps the energy up. And I'd happily do a delivery service for people who couldn't tear themselves away from the bow. And the icebergs would just get more and more, and we finally make it to Antarctica. And this is our first landing, and this is on Half Moon Island. And this is a really active island with dolphin gulls, Antarctic shags, northern giant petrels, and Antarctic terns, but also snowy sheathbills, which is what I've pictured here. And they scavenge poo from uh, the penguin colonies, so they just absolutely love following penguins, just waiting for them to go to the toilet to get a fresh meal, really rather repulsive. Uh, but they seem to enjoy it. Um, and uh, it's a good chin, chin strap colony uh, here. There are many young fluffy youngsters as well, quite a lot of activity on the penguin highways as birds sort of ferried back and forth. And the number of humpbacks that we saw down here once we got onto the peninsula of Antarctica was just staggering. We totaled 198 individuals recorded but in reality it was far higher of course because that wasn't including all of the ones that were coming up when we were having meals and, and at night of course passing us so we don't know the real number that we had but uh, there were absolutely hundreds of them no doubt and we had a fantastic morning at a spot called Foyne Harbour and this is a totally still calm bay where um, all of the groups found humpbacks and out in a little Zodiac cruise. And in my boat, we came across a group of three, which were just having a nap. And that's when I photographed this one here. And we bobbed along next to them. We actually switched our engines off so that we could just be very peaceful and not disturb them. Uh, and we bobbed along next to them while they give out huge, deep breaths, almost sound like elephants trumpeting. Uh, and they're really quite pongy breaths as well, very fishy. Um, but um, it's a nice problem to have, I think, when a, a humpback whale is coming so close to you that you can smell its breath. How wonderful and what a nice occupational hazard for me to have, I think. And then we make it onto Antarctica itself. So this was our continental landing, uh, which was just wonderful. This is por Portal Point. Um, and some of us enjoyed having a leg stretch up to a viewpoint here, uh, which is where I've come up to. But you can see the others far below me for other folk who didn't want to uh, come up here or you could just have a little walk up to this snowy hill here and um, so really just uh, depends on what people want to do you can stay around photographing things and just enjoy the scenery wherever you are you're going to see fantastic things I was standing at the top of this hill looking down into the bay uh, looking at humpback whales and some people were going back in the zodiac to the boat um, and they didn't even realize a huge humpback whale was right behind them and I was watching it with my binoculars with some guests uh, just just a magical place absolutely fantastic um, nice opportunity for us to see some chinstrap penguins as well. We had a couple there that were around us. Um, we also went uh, through the Le Maire Channel, which is a narrow passage bordered with spectacular cliffs and just astounding glaciers, truly stunning scenery. Uh, managed to get snow petrol here uh, as well, which Tim will uh, talk about shortly. Uh, we stopped off at a Yulur Island for a daily penguins. Uh, this is a, a better photograph. 
uh, of them here. Uh, lovely to see them um, on their nests and sort of bickering and they're just so afraid to leave their nests. They really do just stay there um, and, and don't move around too much. But these ones have just come in off the water. So I managed to get a photograph of them actually in the snow and not on their nests. Uh, Coverville Island was another favorite spot of mine. This is a wonderful spot for a Gen 2 colony. Um, you can see them with their chicks here. They've all got uh, usually two chicks, one or two chicks, and they're doing loud trumpeting calls when they're throwing their heads back um, and holding their head up. And it's also a lovely spot to cool off if you've got a bit hot walking around uh, and you want to have a little dip, an opportunity to chill out on Coverville. So uh, some of us, uh, myself, and I think about 15 uh, clients went for a polar plunge uh, and had a little swim uh, next to an iceberg. And uh, yeah, it was um, a sort of race to get a hot chocolate once we got back on board, but certainly something that was quite invigorating <laughs> and nice to do. And we went to a fantastic spot that was known by the uh, expedition guides as an iceberg graveyard. And it was here that we had our first proper experience of leopard seals. And we found eight leopard seals, which was just absolutely superb. And the photographers were uh, really keen on waiting for them to yawn. Um, and this one was thinking about doing a yawn, um, but didn't quite do a yawn. So it actually looks like it's just about to sneeze. Um, but these are really top apex predators. They're enormous and they feed on uh, penguins uh, mainly, but will take uh, other seals as well. And this is uh, the group here, uh, one of the Zodiac uh, cruisers just approaching one of the leopard seals. And as we were sailing back to the main boat, we had one actually slide off an ice floe and start following our boat. Um, and it was right alongside us for five or 10 minutes, just playing in the bubbles. Um, and it was quite disconcerting, really. We, we were very safe, of course, in the in the Zodiac, but it just had its eye on us and it seemed to just be enjoying itself, just, just toying with us, playing in the bubbles around our propeller. But we could have reached out and touched it. It was quite remarkable. Um, and this is more of the iceberg graveyard. We decided actually to stay out a little bit longer because the sightings were so good this afternoon. We thought, oh, well, let's just go back out again. Um, we were just about to go back to the boat, but let's just have another 45 minutes out. But as is the nature of Antarctica, the weather changed in minutes uh, from going to being quite clear skies. Uh, so after this, you've got some snow coming in and then minutes later, it was this. And we all got called back to the boat um, and definitely a race to hot chocolate. I think this is me and my group at this point. And I think uh, a few of us were thinking, whose idea was this to stay out? But you have to have a good sense of humor and uh, kind of adopt the expedition mentality that we have um, with doing these trips. It was really good fun and all back on board and get toasty warm again within minutes. And that wasn't the, the end to the day. As we sailed off um, later in the evening, we had orca. Uh, I had a big bang at my door and came running down saying orca. And uh, you know, one moment where I just nipped down to my cabin. So this was just fantastic. And it just we thought the day couldn't get any better. We had a pod of eight orca around us. Uh, really quite fantastic. And there were some young ones. There was an adult male with the big dorsal fin, a young one playing with an ice floe as well. Uh, just remarkable. And on one of our evenings down in Antarctica, uh, one of our last days, we had a superb barbecue, which you might not think of as being conducive to being out in Antarctica. But it worked really well. And once the tables were cleared, um, we turned it into a little disco. So seeing 100 people dancing about on deck in the snow, togged up in winter gear was really quite something. And um, we also had humpback whales all around us while we were uh, having our meal. And it ended up just, you, could, you couldn't keep track of them. It was humpback whale and have a bit of your burger and another humpback whale. Quite astonishing. But I've deliberately missed out one of the highlights that we had um, on that day. Um, because I'm going to hand you over to Tim, who is going to tell you all about it. Back over to you, Tim. Right. Well, joy of joys. Next slide, please. <laughs> we came across an emperor penguin. Now, if you watch David Attenborough programmes or indeed lots of programmes on uh, 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 television about the Antarctic, everybody shows you... Uh, emperor penguins but you get uh, the idea that you just go down there and they're everywhere but they're not they're one of the most difficult species to see because once they're at sea they just vanish 
in you know they're, they're diving deep and a very low density but when they come back to the breeding colonies they nest on sea ice which and usually several miles inland which means you can't just sort of get out of a zodiac and climb onto uh, uh, ice at the edge where it would be thin and um and and then even if you did you'd have to walk several miles to reach them so the the only way of guaranteeing to see an emperor penguin is actually to take a helicopter uh, from your boat uh, to go and land near a colony the several miles and some companies were charging absolutely silly money i mean i'm talking uh, uh, you know uh, i think 85000 pounds to go and twitch emperor penguins was the biggest uh, price that i saw to guarantee that you would see them at the peak of the season um so uh, but uh, f we just managed to stumble across this one that was in the middle of a gen 2 colony and they're so big i mean they look a bit like king penguins but they're um uh, you know 30% larger than a king penguin and about 50% heavier. Really big, robust things. Um, I think the next slide shows it um, with the Gen 2 penguin. And Gen 2s aren't small penguins. You know, they're a, a, a good medium-sized penguin. But there you can see it completely dwarf next to it. And um, I, I was just in awe of this. I just could not believe what we were looking at. But um, the um, uh, because uh, all of the um, leopard seals have been found that Sarah just told you about, she um, she uh, lots of the people started saying, "Well, we've seen the emperor penguin now. Can we go and look at the leopard seals, please?" So we had to leave the emperor penguin after um, you know just a few minutes, really. And uh, anyway, we saw the, the leopard seals and spent lots of time with them. And then my boat started uh, asking, "Well, could we go back and just see if the emperor's come any closer?" And so uh, I said, well, that would suit me fine. So we asked our uh, Zodiac driver and he, he said, yeah, if you want to go, let's do that. So he drove us back round to the Emperor colony and it was sat on the beach much, much closer this time. And there it was in, in all its glory. But literally, after I'd managed to take two or three photographs, that blizzard that arrived out of nowhere that Sarah showed you about um, just came out of nowhere and everybody put their cameras away and everybody hid and covered themselves up and we got the order to come back to the ship immediately. So that was the last picture that I managed to take of it when it was really close on the beach. But uh, what, uh, uh, you know, it really was a, a bucket list bird for uh, every everybody who saw it. It was, um, you know, one that we didn't expect, but, uh, um, uh, and that was on the day when we saw orcas and, uh, uh, yeah, and the iceberg alley and all the leopard seals. It was just, uh, you know, the best day imaginable. And it was also, um, uh, if we can go on, uh, th these uh, blizzards created some wonderful, spectacular um, uh, scenery. This was a blizzard just arriving, but whilst there was still light on the iceberg, so you get that lovely blue coloration. And I just managed to catch the uh, the grey-headed albatross uh, uh, flying over the iceberg there. But what a dramatic sky there! You know, it was uh, it, it was just um, uh, heaven for me. Most people, when they saw this bad weather arriving, did just went straight indoors to shelter and i thought oh no i can see a photo opportunity here and stayed out and uh, i'm glad that i did because i thought that was a, a pretty good one even by my standards i thought next please uh, that's what a gray-headed albatross looks like when you see them really close um it's um it, it's uh you can see that it, it's about the size of a of a black browed albatross and looks pretty similar to it from the neck backwards but it has that lovely gray head and a completely different bill with that lovely ring of uh of, of gold all around the top and bottom of it uh next please um also whilst we were down here we were seeing lots of the light mantled sooty albatrosses this is the southern counterpart of the sooty albatross that i mentioned earlier but uh, again some of them we had them right over the boats just uh, hovering around but it was great to get them with uh, uh with icebergs in the background and uh, speaking of icebergs in the background here's the common one again the uh, uh, black browed albatross but that was uh again with one of the uh, uh the, the polar ice cap carving bits where you've got a, a, a an arch like girdle door in the snow in the ice there and a, a beautiful black browed albatross uh, uh, sailing by it um next please 
And um, this was in uh, iceberg, the iceberg graveyard that Sarah mentioned. Uh, those tiny little black dots on top of the, uh, uh, the the iceberg. I mean, it really was just you know it was one after the other. It was quite hard to find a little path to get in between them. There were so many icebergs together, a real Titanic nightmare moment. Uh, but those little birds that were sat on there are Antarctic shags. Uh, the imperial or blue-eyed shag was split into three different species. So the imperial, uh, which is the South American and Falklands one. Then there's the South Georgia one that Sarah's already shown you. And this one is the Antarctic shag. The next picture shows a much more close-up of it. It's uh, It's got a subtly different face pattern, but it's much, much larger than the others and has that little white spot in the middle of its back as well. But that's the um, uh, the Antarctic shag there. And a few of the other seabirds that we saw down there were um, uh, another prion. This is the Antarctic prion that uh, is, is the common one in the um, uh, in the cold waters. Very similar to the other prions, but it has a more black and white stripy head pattern and it's a little bit more robust as well. Um, next one as well. And uh, I mentioned the blue petrel. That's a slight closer up of it showing the uh, the white tail pattern it's um it, it's closely related to the prions but not to, it's a cousin of them rather than in the, uh, uh, the 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 immediate family group um next one now, wherever we get snow on the ground, I started to see uh, snow petrels, but you really need ice in the water. It's only found in the coldest of areas. It's uh, you know very difficult to see away from those areas. And uh, yeah, this one is one just towering above a, a leaden sky over uh, a, a little iceberg there. I think I took a closer one of it. It's the next slide. Uh, yeah, that, that's um, a, a close-up of it as well, uh, flying right next to the boat there. Um, also, um, we went to y Yalur Island, and this was a um, um, uh, sorry, this was in Coverville Island, and this is the third species of skewer that I was mentioning. This is the South Polar skewer, and this is another one that, when it's finished breeding, it comes right into the northern hemisphere, including the North Atlantic. But for some reason, it always seems to stay on the American side and doesn't come over to the uh, the British side of the Atlantic. But you can see how uh, hardy it is. It was sat there in a snow snowstorm and it just sat it out whilst the snow just settled on its back there but um uh, but again they're quite common down in antarctica and then the next one uh, i've got the, the the seals down here weddell seals are um, uh, they're not numerically the commonest but it's the one that we probably most commonly see again no fear of humans they're completely indifferent to humans so they just lie around uh, they've got a very very patterned uh, pelage uh, almost like a roll of axminster carpet when you see them there and really big and bulky they need lots of blubber to enable them to uh, have the um, uh, survive in the cold water and they basically tough it out and live on sea ice and they 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 uh, chew holes in the ice as breathing holes that they keep ice free and then just go into there to feed and then come out again and uh, um, uh, the next one is the crab eater seal which is a much more pugnacious one i managed to get this one with its eye with its mouth open and you can see the characteristic teeth there they're almost like little christmas trees and the, the the branches of the christmas trees have got slits that allow the water to pass through and like a cartoon shark they uh, the the teeth interlock perfectly but they've got these little slits for water and when they've grabbed a mouthful of krill underwater they can then use their tongue like a siphon push the uh, the water out and then they're just left with the krill to eat and i should have said despite the name crab eater they don't eat crabs that specialist dentition is all about eating krill and uh, the third um, uh, one just to show it you here's another one yawning this is a this is the leopard seal on a uh, um, uh, uh, on a, a little ice floe there it wasn't such a close one but they too as well as being highly predatory and eating other seals and uh, penguins and things like that they also feed on krill and all of the back teeth have got the little christmas tree type uh, uh, configuration like crab eater seal has as well there uh, next please um, on uh, uh, Yalur Island, uh, this is where all the little Gen 2 colonies are, and you can see they they have to find the ice-free areas, which is actually the slightly higher areas where the wind has blown the snow and the ice off. 
and it's the bare areas, but they can't lay their eggs on bare rock because it's too cold and the eggs would get chilled. So they have to go and collect pebbles from the beaches. Uh, but they, they usually pair for life. But when they've um, uh, one of them has to guard the pebbles whilst the other one goes off and gets more, because if they both went off in search of pebbles, they're absolute thieves. They just they would just get, wipe out the, the neighbor's nest uh, whilst they're there. So the, the, the penguins can't even leave for a comfort break and if you look at the top right there you'll see the uh, penguin defecating on its neighbor uh just there that's uh because uh, and so often in the penguin corner these things are just covered in guano there and the next slide actually shows one of these pebble thieves in action oh no sorry it doesn't this is one that was climbing up the uh, the hill to its uh, nesting colony in the uh, um in uh, with the snow falling all around it and the next one shows the um uh, there so that was a, a one of them pinching a pebble and uh, the other one having a go at it, trying to stop it. But they really, these pebbles really are in such short supply that uh, you know they'll uh, that they'll just thieve all the time to get them. Um, the next one. I'll just clarify for you folks. These are, are daily penguins. I think you accidentally said gentoo penguins. Oh, did I? Oh, I'm but, terribly sorry. Yeah, no, it's all right. A <laughs> total yeah. accident. Um, too many penguins on the brain. Yeah, yeah a daily no, penguins sorry. here. Yeah. Named after a daily land, and the daily was the uh, a Delhi. Sorry, is the pronunciation was the wife of a polar explorer and captain down there. So he named the daily land, and the penguins were named after the land there. Uh, then uh, it was time to leave Antarctica, and uh, so as we headed out into the sunset, we still had things like light-mantled sooty albatross gliding round the boat in uh, in uh, the wonderful uh, uh, pastel shades of evening. There, you can even see a drop of water on the uh, uh, the bill of it there. And then uh, night fell, and then when we arrived the next morning, we had a day in the Drake Passage, which is supposedly the roughest um, uh, um, uh, strait of water on the planet. But it's never been that bad when I've been there. It's sometimes a bit choppy, but uh, because there's no land masses to stop the winds just whizzing around the planet. Uh, but then when we travelled through the Drake Passage, we came up to Cape Horn, which is the most southerly tip of South America. And here is Cape Horn. Um, and you can see all the bird activity on the uh, on, on the sea there, huge numbers of them. And these were largely black-browed albatrosses. Uh, the next one shows a big raft of black-browed albatrosses. And it almost makes a, 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 a ridiculous that, um, you know, we made such a fuss over that one that appeared at Benton Cliffs and people came from all over the country to go and look at one of them. And here you've got rafts of hundreds, if not thousands of them uh, off uh, South America here. So that was a great thing to see. We were seeing penguins in amongst them as well and more shear waters and great shear waters and and um, and the, 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 the and um, uh, Chilean skewers as well. But also just as we uh, uh, as we approached the, uh, the the land on the last evening, we had a load of Peel's dolphins uh, surrounding the boat. Uh, these are the ones with the distinctive black face that I told you about, the black face and the black shin that uh, we should showed you earlier and uh, again we had them bow riding and lots of them all around there and then as we headed uh, into the uh, the beagle channel again to uh, um, into darkness the next slide i think that's the uh, the final sunset of, of the evening before we uh, uh, arrived back at ushuaia the following morning and that was it our three-week trip to uh, antarctica south georgia and the falklands <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, that has been fantastic to relive that. And thank you so much for listening, folks. Really hope you've enjoyed listening to our talk. We've overrun slightly by 15 minutes, but it is hard really to shorten uh, a three-week trip, isn't it, Tim? That was just so fantastic and action-packed. Um, if you're interested in joining us for the next cruise, please do register your interest via the tour page online. You'll be sent a link to that um, tomorrow uh, an automatic email will come from zoom it'll have a link to our antarctica page or you can just drop us an email at the office and we can um, register your interest the next full boat charter will be in 2027 but we'll be taking a small group on the ortelius the same vessel um in tw january 25 um again we'll be announcing dates soon um but please just contact us via the tour page to register your interest and now we'll take any questions that you may have. So please do pop any questions you have in the Q&A section on your screen. And I'll just stop sharing there. And we'll just have a quick look at um, the comments. Thank you so much for your lovely comments that you're saying. 
Um, yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks, Don, for your nice comments. And Nora. Uh, all right, do we have... Um, ah, the dates of that trip. We went on the 13th of January, um, but then we had a couple of days before we actually got on board um, the vessel. I think we got on board the vessel... Um, 15th. 15th, that would probably be right. 15th yeah. or 16th, um, Peter. Uh, and then we disembarked on the 2nd of February um, and we flew back up from Ushuaia to Buenos Aires, overnighted in Buenos Aires and then came home. So um, thank you, uh, Lillian, brilliant. I'm definitely up for one of your next trips. That's that's great, love to hear it. Um, and we don't have uh, any other questions. If you do have other questions, folks, please type them now. Otherwise, we'll just say thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we'll wrap up uh, the evening. So we've got a question from Mark Archer, who says, uh, Tim, this is one for you. Could you advise the best bird field guide for the area? Yeah, it's the um, uh, the, the guide to the birds of Chile is probably the best one, Mark, uh, because that covers Antarctica, South Georgia and the Falklands uh, and all the birds of Chile, which is great for when we're uh, down there. But it's a relatively slim volume, but it has great illustrations. And uh, uh, yeah, that's the one that most people use there. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, we had a question here. Uh, are the avian flu restrictions still in South Georgia? Yeah, they are, to my knowledge, um, still um, enforced at the moment. So this is um, the decisions of the South Georgia government, uh, obviously taking the measures that they need to to protect uh, not only the penguins, but uh, the elephant seals as well, which are being impacted by bird flu. So this um, results in extreme uh, biosecurity, which we were actually very impressed by, weren't we, Tim? You know, they're taking it mm -hmm. really, really seriously. Lots of boot scrubbing um, and things going over with a fine tooth comb with magnifying glasses to look for uh, any um, organic matter that could have been transported between the islands. And also um, a member of the uh, government actually came on board the boat before we disembarked to do a check um, of half the group. Um, they take a random sample of half the group to check that we were um, deemed clean enough uh, to, to be able to land. Um, so I've got another question here uh, or comment. Really great and informative session with amazing photos. Um, thank you. And we'll be registering. That's that's great. Um, Gillian's asking, what's the difference between the 25 and 2027 proposed tours? So Gillian, the next time we'll take a full charter, which is what we did this January, where we chartered the whole boat and it's a Nature Trek exclusive charter. So you'll have Nature Trek guides uh, on board and everybody on board the boat uh, is with Nature Trek. So we'll have the shared enthusiasm for the wildlife um, and we're all one big group essentially. So we can do all of our briefings together in the evening and all of our checklists together. And that's what we um, we do every sort of three years or so. So that's what we did this year in January. And the next time we'll be doing a full boat charter with a hundred passengers will be in January, 2027. So in January, 25, We'll probably book uh, 20 spaces or so um, on board one of the boats and you'll just go with one leader. Um, so um, it's quite it's quite similar. You, you'll have one leader that will be out out there with you and you'll be doing your checklist in your own small group. Um, but there'll be other passengers on the boat who haven't booked with Nature Trek uh, as well. So um, I'll just have a quick... Um, the holiday looks amazing, but I worry that there's a lot of sailing. Is there plenty to do whilst traveling? Uh, well, I think so. This is a question from Linda Young. I mean, I wasn't bored once because it was hard to take your, your eyes off the sea because you just don't know uh, what's going to pop up next. I think you'd agree, Tim. I think you you came off the bow uh, far fewer than I did, actually, fewer times than I did. Um, personally, I don't think uh, people struggled with the amount of sea time. Um, the longest stretch we had at sea was about three days, was it, Tim? Three days between Falklands and South Georgia. That's it, yeah. So during that time, um, it's really quite exciting to be out on deck, but, um, and you're talking to a lot of people um, in the in the saloon area and just getting to know people. There's a lovely sense of camaraderie and community on the ship. Um, nice to be out on the bow um, and looking for things. And of course, people do enjoy taking a book with them as well and just sitting and relaxing. And there's a huge amount of literature actually on board 
and the vessel all about the area as well. So I found people would quite often enjoy taking a coffee inside and just immersing themselves in either the uh, the field guides and identification books of the species there, or either books about the the history, you know, books on Shackleton or books on glaciers and icebergs and how they were formed or um, books on South Georgia and early explorers and things like that. So there's a lot to do, but also, as I said, uh, we run a lot of talks during the the days as well as particularly the sea days so there's usually three uh, talks which will be run on the sea days and they can be up to an hour each as well so um, when you've added up that and uh, an hour for your meal times your breakfast your lunch and your evening meal um i don't feel like the dra the days drag on at all you just you still want to be down there you wish it would take longer don't you <laughs> yeah. um so uh, we've got another question do they provide clothing at all um, so the only clothing that um, we provide with the boat are the welly boots, and these are fantastic. You don't need to take your own footwear for landings. In fact, we prefer that you use these welly boots because they're quite easy to clean for biosecurity reasons. Um, so the only footwear that you need to take is the footwear that you would be using on the boat. Um, and we don't provide any other clothing. Clothing. So what you would need um, are the obvious things. So really good pair of um uh, waterproof trousers, insulated trousers, and the most important thing is a very good jacket. Um, but we provide a full clothing list of things that you would need, a kit list um, at the point of booking or ahead of that if you'd like to see it as well. Um, Kevin Fisher is asking, do you experience any problems with camera batteries and temperatures? Um, I didn't actually. Um, Tim, did you? I, I didn't either. I always keep one spare battery with me um but the, the the camera batteries can drain quicker yeah weather but i've i've never had a problem with it i usually have two batteries one in the camera and i rarely have to change when i'm out and about mm -hmm. um and kevin i'll just add to that that i did notice my my batteries drained more quickly than um when i'm guiding out in the tropics for example but i wouldn't say it was a problem by any means um like tim says i always go out with two or even three um, batteries with me so you've got one in your camera and the best thing to do is keep one in a pocket that's an internal pocket so it's keeping warm and then you can kind of just swap them out and then I'd usually have one charging on the boat as well um, and then you just sort of get into the swing of things of just changing things out when you come back on board. Um, did anyone get seasick? Uh, Sheila Thomas is asking. Um, I think it's inevitable that when you're on a, a boat in choppy water, some people might feel the motion of the boat a little bit, but um, seasickness tablets were um, can be bought from the reception on board the boat. Um, and I don't think we had uh, any problems, certainly not that I was aware of um, either. The doctor could provide um, uh, the scolopamine patches as well that people put behind their ear. That yeah. to, uh, people who use them said that they uh, uh, they worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can have these little patches behind your ear, which um, which I used actually, and that felt absolutely fine, um, which were, were great. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Roger Tull is saying, don't forget the bridge access. Yeah, that's something that we could mention as well, actually. This boat yeah. is, the crew on board this boat are absolutely fantastic for allowing us up to the bridge, and they're really um, very flexible with us and very accommodating. So as long as we're respectful and quiet when we go up there. Um, it's a it's a wonderful place to be if you don't want to be out on the bow of the boat, particularly if there is any spray coming over. Um, so you can be up there, fantastic vantage point, uh, and a great spot to uh, to keep warm with a a coffee. Um, and we've got a nice comment from Alison Barclay. Uh, we did this trip eight years ago, best trip ever in the world, especially landing at St Andrews Bay in South Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and seasick, this did happen, but great doctor on board who provided patches. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Nice to see you here. Um, hope you and Roger are well. Um, and just checking to see if we've got any more questions that haven't been answered. Um, and, um, oh, there, there's a question for a, a rough price of the trip. Um, so the, the price started, it depends um, on the cabins. Um, so the Pod cabins went from thirteen nine nine five. Um, this would be for a cabin with uh, four bunks, and um, this includes flights um, up to about sixteen nine nine five, uh, which was for a twin. 
Um, so we will be releasing dates and prices for the 25 departure, as I say, um, as, as soon as we can. So please do register your interest um, and then you'll be emailed with the, the full dates and the different prices because it varies on um, which cabins you wish to book as well. Um, thank you so much for all the lovely comments. Uh, it's really nice to see so many familiar names here as well from so many people who are on board with us in January. Uh, nice to, uh, to hear from Richard as well. Um, and thank you all so much for, for joining. I think we've got through all of the questions. If you do think of any questions that you haven't thought of now, folks, please just drop me an email. You can get me at sarah at naturetrek.co.uk. That's S-A-R-A, -A, no H. So Sarah spelled Sarah. Um, and uh, I'll be happy to answer it for you. And uh, I think we can call that a wrap, Tim. Okay. Thanks yeah, everybody. great. Thank you so much, folks. And please do join us at our next roadshow evening, uh, which will be Tim and myself again, actually, although I won't be presenting, I'll be hosting, where we'll be talking on celebrating cetaceans. This is on the 2nd of May, and uh, we'll be talking on the global state of cetaceans from one of my ex-colleagues from the Whale and Dolphin Charity Orca, which will be delivered by Anna Bunny, the head of education for Orca, who'll be doing a big update uh, for you all on the global state of cetaceans. And our very own Tim will be taking you to Baja, California and celebrating the whales there. So that's on the 2nd of May at 7.30. So please do sign up for that, which you can do so via our website. All right, folks, thank you so much for joining and we hope to see you again soon. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. <laughs>